Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. The, um, uh, we are very, very unfashionable uh, this morning. The, uh, all of us, not just me. The, uh, because we're going to talk about politics, and the country has stopped doing it. And it's quite happy about stopping doing it. But what we are, we're taking the view that, as always in life, or at least often, being unfashionable is underrated. The, um, and it's important to discuss things that matter, even though they're not fashionable. And we think there's two things in politics that are... Uh, really important and actually happening right now, even though the kind of Brexit semi-being done thing is taking out the immediate heat from day-to-day -day politics over the last year. And those are big political decisions being taken. The first, and both are being taken by one of each for the big political parties. The first is, what does this new government actually do against the backdrop of its new coalition? Uh, and we're going to be discussing that big question uh, next Thursday on the 6th of Feb with Matt Hancock. Um, Mark Logan, the new MP for Bolton in the now blue-ish bit of the wall, and Anna McCullough from The Telegraph. So that's that question. But this morning we're discussing a different one, which is what on earth does a Labour Party's future look like after truly catastrophic election results? And what does it <coughs> do? What lessons does it learn? And what are its reflections on its longer-term history for decisions it takes about the future? So that's what we're going to do um, this morning, and we're going to be mixing politics with policy um, and sophology with uh, less data-driven, what's the right thing to do uh, side of the argument. So that is our plan. Now to do that, uh, we're going to hear first of all some slides from Paula Surridge, who is a political sociologist at University of Bristol, and anyone that hasn't been following everything she's written or posted on Twitter uh, over the last uh, month or so hasn't been learning enough about the last election. It's been great, and it's been taking different, it's not just the same old, same old, which is what a lot of uh, election uh, a lot of post-election readouts are basically telling you why I was always right uh, about whatever I said before the election. That is not what you get from Paula, so you should all be reading what she said, and you're going to see a few slides, a subset of that. Uh, now, then we're going to hear from Yvette Cooper, the MP for Normanton, Pontefract, Castleford and Nottingham, the, um, who is, has been many things, but since 2016 has been chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee and was elected unopposed yesterday. Congratulations. It's good to win an election. Even if, not, <laughs> even, if not, even if not the election, but, you know, swings and roundabouts and all that. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Paul Mason, journalist and author, whose most recent book, Clear Bright Future, was published in 2019, which he did an event on in exactly that seat here uh, back then, um, but has been touring around the country post-election, learning about how Labour should and is responding to what is going on. And then we're going to hear from you all. So that's the plan. Paul is going to kick us off with some slides. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. Oops. Microphone took me by surprise. Um, apologies for sort of standing behind the lectern, but it's the easiest place to have notes and slides and clickers all at the same time. Uh, it's already moved on for me. So I was given this brief, how should Labour navigate the 2020s? And I'm not going to talk about policy. It's not really what I do. I'm a political sociologist and the thing I'm most interested in are voters and what voters think. Um, but I also think it's probably a little bit early to start thinking about what policy to put in place. Um, we don't really know how the next two, two or three years are going to develop. Um, and I think actually there are some more fundamental questions that need to be answered before you can begin to talk about policy, um, not least how you connect with voters. I'm going to suggest that the key to understanding the future is to begin from where the voters actually are. Not where you'd like them to be, um, but where they actually are. And I get shouted at about this, at least virtually, quite a lot, for suggesting that we should just throw principles out the window and, and move towards voters. That's not what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that the party has to move to those positions itself, but needs to understand what those positions are in order to find a way to speak to and with, not at, um, those groups of voters. Now this morning on the train down, very very early train down this morning, um, I saw um, coverage of a report um, into Labour's election defeat which suggested that we can pin all the blame on Brexit. Nice, it's always nice to have a scapegoat and Brexit provides a very useful one. So I want to start off by trying to pit, put, put a pin in that myth a little bit. Um, and suggest that if you start with that as your um, diagnosis, then you're going to end up with the wrong, the wrong treatment. So my first slide. Now, first of all, I will apologise for only talking about England and Wales in these particular slides. 
Um, and people again shout at me for that. My, my very first academic job was working on Scottish elections. So I haven't forgotten that Scotland exists. It's just the traje trajectory of seats in Scotland is so different that I think analytically it makes sense to separate them out. And what I've done here is a very simple typology of Labour seats, seats that were lost before Brexit and seats that were lost after, not after Brexit, but after the EU referendum vote, seats that Labour held on to across all four elections from 2010, and then seats that Labour gained either before the referendum vote or after the referendum vote. They are smaller in number, as I'm sure you all know. So roughly speaking, um, the first two categories have um, somewhere between 60 and 65 seats in them. The held seats are 166. Gained in 10 or 15 are 18 seats. Gained in 17 or 19 are 16 seats, but of course 15 of which were in 2017. And the key thing that jumps out at you when you look at this chart, I hope, is that the two groups of seats that were lost are distinctly different from the two groups of seats that were gained. So seats that were lost in 2010 or 2015 are equally leave leaning as seats that were lost in 2017 or 2019, which doesn't strike me as very strong evidence that Brexit was the problem if you were losing Brexit-leaning seats, leave-leaning seats, before anybody had even thought of having um, Brexit. You know, we're talking about 2010 here. We're talking before it was even a manifesto promise. Now, the reason for that is it reflects a wider restructuring of the Labour vote in the electorate. And um, the EU referendum vote itself reflects this restructuring. So in this next slide, I have here the per average percentage of people in working class occupations by constituency and the average percentage of people with degrees. And it's, each of them show that same pattern, that the two groups of seats that Labour lost are similar to each other and the two groups of seats that Labour gained are similar to each other. The pattern is mirrored because Labour lost seats where there were more work people in working class occupations and gained seats where there were more people with degrees. The pattern by education is a little bit more distinctive, actually, and that's a really important point when we start talking about what's going on and, and who's moving around. And I just want to really stress this one statistic, because for me, it really sums up what's going on. If you look at the seats that Labour lost between, in, in either 2010 or 2015, the average percentage of people with degrees in those constituencies is about 12%. If you look at the seats Labour won, in either, just take the whole lot together, all 34 of them if you like, the average percentage of people with degrees in those constituencies is about 26%, more than double. It's an astonishing difference in the set of seats being lost and the set of seats being gained. So I want to offer you um, an explanation of why I think that's happened. Um, and you'll have to apologise for the kind of brevity of this. There's a lot more going on that I can't squeeze into the, into the eight minutes. I think this is a symptom, what we see here at the constituency level, of a realignment of the connections between political values and politics, which has in part been driven by the long-term decline of party identity. So the bigger argument, if I had um, all day to convince you, would be that as people have become disconnected from parties, so they're no longer making those flash automatic decisions who to vote for, their value sets become more important as the heuristics through which they view politics rather than the kind of um, party-tinted glasses, if you like, that people had um, 30 or 40 years ago. So I want to show you some data about values. The problem I have here is that in order to do that for the 29 election, I need data on individual voters, and I don't have that yet. It hasn't been released yet, so I can't show you 2019. I've got to show you elections running up to 2019. In fact, um, we could have a little game of um, pin 2019. It's not, it's not a donkey, but pin, pin 2019 on the charts. <laughs> Um, so you can work out where you think the 2019 voters might be. Let me just explain the sort of space I've created here. There are two dimensions to political values that I'm using here. Um, and there's a long argument amongst political scientists whether you need one, two, three, or 103. Um, but most accounts come down on the side of needing at least two. And these are on the... Um, 
I always get the wrong way around, horizontal axis are moving from left to right, are left right values, where low values on that scale um, represent economically left wing positions. Those are measured by items that ask questions like, are you in favour of um, renationalising the railways? Do you think big businesses have too much power? Should we redistribute wealth? Things you would associate normally with an economic left-right <coughs> divide. The other dimension, and this, <laughs> I'm calling it the other dimension, what we exactly call it is really contentious. And sometimes in the past I've called it a liberal authoritarian dimension and been shouted at. Um, so I moved to calling it social liberal, social conservative, but I think actually that's capturing something different and people then misinterpret it. I think actually authoritarian, I'm just going to have to learn to live with being shouted at because it's actually a better label. <coughs> so these items have been asked on the British Election Study series going back to 1992, the same items. And what I've plotted on this particular chart for you are the average positions of voters for the Labour Party at each election and the average position of voters for the Conservative Party at each election since 1992. And there's lots we could talk about there, but I think I'll just draw three key points out. First of all, on that social, liberal, authoritarian, conservative dimension, um, prior to 2015, Labour voters were pretty much in the centre of that dimension. Okay, so when we're talking about more socially conservative or more authoritarian voters. We're not talking about absolutely socially conservative voters or absolutely authoritarian voters. Actually, they're largely around the centre on that scale. <clears throat> if we look at 2015 and 2017 for the Conservatives on that scale, they now occupy the position that the Labour voters used to be in. <clears throat> Labour has moved, Labour voters have moved distinctively towards the liberal side of that scale in 2015 and 2017. And some of the explanation for that is the collapse of the Lib Dem vote um, with the more liberal parts of that collapsing into the Labour vote. Also, the final thing I want to draw out of that chart is that Conservative voters are not especially economically right wing and in fact have moved into that centre ground over time. Um, a feature which I think is going to be really important for the next um, two or three years of policy making. Now, I don't, as I said, I don't have any data from the 2019 election directly, but my final slide is 2019 data. It's just it was collected just after the um, European Parliament elections. And what I've done with this data, so circles represent Labour 2017 voters and squares represent Conservative 2017 voters. And then I've coloured the blobs according to the party that, that they're now considering voting for. This is taken as a, if you just asked people who they were considering voting for back in June 2019, you get an awful lot of Lib Dem voters and an awful lot of Brexit party voters. And it's quite difficult to, to understand the dynamics of what were going on. Instead, this is a measure that asks people, how likely are you to ever vote for the party? And I've taken any, on, on a 0 to 10 scale, and anybody who gave a score of 6 or higher for a party is considered a likely voter for that party. So for some of these groups, there's overlap. Um, some people might actually have um, two or three um, parties that they say they're likely to vote for. And actually, that's much more common um, on the left than it is on the right, because there's more parties to choose from. <coughs> so two, again, two key features that I want to draw out of this data for you. Um, the first is that all those different groups of Labour 17 voters are quite spread out in that space. So we're, we're used to talking about the um, divide between the social liberals and the social conservatives. That's become kind of part of the discourse that's been going on um, during the election campaign and since. And understandably, because Labour voters that were considering voting for the Brexit party are quite a long way removed from those that were still considering Labour and those that were considering the Lib Dems at this point. But the other point that I think has been missed out of this whole discussion, and I think it's very dangerous if it gets missed altogether, is that the Labour voters who were considering voting for the Conservatives, the direct switchers who cost everybody twice as much, are a bit more socially conservative, but they're also a bit more centrist as far as economics goes. 
And so whilst we see um, opinion polling showing individual policies being popular, those voters that were being um, that at this point we're considering the Conservatives are not occupying those very left-wing positions on economics. And I think it's important that if we get too hung up on how we can unite the Brexit party curious with the Lib Dem curious, if I can put it that way, um, how we can unite that part of the, of the value space, we forget that there's also another dimension and that Labour have been losing voters on that dimension as well. So my final point here from this chart, my, my final point to leave you with, is also it shows why this job is a little bit easier for the Conservatives. Because if you look at all the square blobs, they are much closer together in that value space than the circle blobs are. So the Labour Party vote is, was more fractured um, prior to 2019 election by these value positions than the Conservative vote was. And that makes it easier for messaging for the Conservatives to hold that vote together. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Paula. You should say thank you for the early morning travel as well for the uh, <laughs> insights and for putting up with everyone shouting at you, which was a running theme. Uh, for what? No one's going to shout this morning. This is, safe. I, I, this, is, this is a safe space. Starting to get used to being shouted at. Okay, fine. Right. That's just British politics, <laughs> circa 21st century. Right. Event. Um, let's just start with that, by thanking Paul, because I think this is really uh, important and powerful analysis. Um, I mean, look, we have to face the scale of our defeat and also how much we let people down, because this is obviously our worst result since the 1930s in terms of our parliamentary result. And I still believe that progressive values and are as important as ever, championing equality, standing up for social justice and fairness. And I also believe still that there is a progressive coalition behind those values across the country. But we were not able to capture it. We were not able to persuade enough people to vote for us this time. And that means that we've let an awful lot of people down. And that is why we have to change and to understand why it is that we lost for um, as in a constituency where we lost a lot of Labour votes, there's no doubt for us on the doorstep, we had perceptions of our leadership came up a lot. Brexit also came up a lot. So too did credibility of our manifesto and also a long term sense of, well, Labour's not going to make any difference, is it? And the only comment I would just make on in Paula's first slide is that I think it's Whilst it is true that the kinds of constituencies that we were losing were similar in uh, 2010 through to 2019, what happened with Brexit is it's like put some of those debates on steroids. Yeah. And so the scale of the loss in vote was, was much greater um, and it, uh, it sort of made much stronger some of those um, trends and issues. Um, I think also at the heart of this is Labour has always been a broad church, has always been a coalition of people with a mix of different values. Most of us have contradictory values ourselves. We have a, some liberal values, some communitarian values and, and a few contradictions within them. There's some issues on which we're strongly to the left, others which we're a bit more centrist and, and we have those contradictions in ourselves, but we've always been a coalition. And so the thing I think that's important on that, that axis, which I think Think are very powerful in explaining some of the changes taking place is it's not just about where Labour's centre of gravity is on the axis, it's actually about our reach along those axes. And where we have been successful in election terms in the past is when we have had broad reach, when we have had an economic coalition from the left through to the centre, when we have had also a social coalition that draws on both liberal and communitarian values. And I particularly talk about communitarian values because sometimes I think because of the way, and, and this reflects some of the academic arguments, but also political arguments that take place about is it liberal, authoritarian, is it liberal, socially conservative and so on. Actually, the group of voters that's always been part of the, the Labour coalition and about Labour values is progressive communitarianism, the belief in social solidarity that is what means you stand together in a strike 
or that means that in working class communities, the support for you take in your neighbor's child if your neighbor is sick, or you have the support for the uh, for local um, uh, community activities and food banks, and also a strong sense of patriotism, support for country as well. So there's a set of progressive communitarian values that I fear has been lost from our coalition, which is not simply about electoral politics, it's also actually about our values and about what kind of party we are uh, and what kind of uh, party we believe in. And if you look back through our past history, for example, Look at the 1945 government managed to be both strongly patriotic and strongly internationalist. We had both of those strands of both liberal and communitarian bound together as part of our, our ethos and our values, similarly through 97 election, whether it was tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, both strands of those values. Sometimes they're put together in a, a sort of slightly confused way. Sometimes there are different bits of compromises, but either way, it's a recognition that those values are both important <coughs> as part of our tradition. And so I think the, the challenge for us on those axes is it's like our coalition along those axes was blown apart on both axes, on the left centre economic axis and on the, the liberal communitarian axis, both at the same time. And towns were caught right in the crisis of both. So think of it, for example, the, the sense that um, uh, Labour is seen as very much becoming a party of the cities, a sort of liberal Labour party of the cities, appealing particularly to younger, more middle class, graduate voters, more liberal uh, voters, whilst the towns uh, sort of, uh, were, were drifting away from uh, working class communities, from smaller towns uh, across the country. And Brexit put that on steroids because in towns like mine in Yorkshire, people thought both the left and centre of the Labour Party had stopped listening to them. Both Jeremy Corbyn and Tony Blair had stopped listening to them. And that sense of distance, that sense of gulf uh, on those values became hugely important. But the, the left centre access also is a challenge for us because this is obviously something we've always been important for us to be both radical and credible that is when we've won when we've had radical ideas but also a sense of credibility that we can actually deliver on them so some of the the supporters that we lost the voters we lost were those who thought that our platform was not credible that we couldn't deliver we wouldn't deliver it or those who thought our uh, platform was traditionally too left-wing, in inverted commas, in a sense of just not reflecting uh, their values. But I think there was also a problem, which is we looked as though actually we didn't have the answers to today's challenges. So for towns like ours in Yorkshire, the traditional labour remedies, whether it be about uh, public ownership, either uh, versions from the 1945, from the 1970s, or versions today. None of those looked like they were going to form the answer to what's happening in our towns. But equally, the kind of strong prescriptions, labour pres traditional prescriptions from the 1960s through the 1990s and noughties about investment in education and expanding education also didn't look like they were the answers for the ch economic challenges facing our towns. Because we have a situation now where economic growth is being concentrated in the cities and where actually the towns are losing old jobs new jobs are being created in the cities and Peter Kellner um, has an example in a blog that he wrote to see where he said um, what is it that Darlington, Keithley, Barrow, Stockton, Walsall, Warrington all have in common the towns which were uh, formerly Labour for a long time which now have a Conservative MP which voted to leave and which also, in the last few years, have lost their Marks and Spencers. Now, we, um, I've never been so grateful as a constituency that uh, lost an awful lot of votes, but still returned a Labour MP, that we won our campaign to keep the Castleford Marks and Spencers <laughs> open. I didn't realise quite how significant that was at the time. But when I raised this with a group of French academics and journalists and politicians, they pointed out that there's some research in France recently which shows which were the towns and the communities that became most active in the Gilets Jaunes 
movement. And they said the towns that were most active were the ones that had lost their superette, the ones that had lost their small supermarket. Similarly, you look at what's happening in the US, and again, it is the smaller town America that has switched from Democrat to Republican. And the communities that are seeing the loss in economic power at a time when power now depends, economic power is not actually just about ownership or education, it's now about your networks and your connections and your agglomeration, your economies of scale. And Labour actually didn't manage to articulate a powerful answer to that about how if we believe in tackling economic injustice and we believe in redistribution of power, how do we answer that for the new economy and the way in which power is concentrating in new and different ways? And unless we have an answer to that, then actually we don't look as if we are standing up for those who actually feel like they are not getting a fair deal in the new economy, who are in different ways of technology and trade, and for whom... Voting in the end for Boris Johnson was at least voting for change because for many people who had voted continually for Labour uh, over very many years or voted for a Labour Council had voted for change just in the same way that voting for Brexit was voting for change and Labour has to embody credible change. So the things therefore the challenge our challenges I think for the 2020s are around how we rebuild our broad church across both dimensions, how we have a credible analysis of the way to redistribute economic power and challenge challenge inequality in the new economy for the 2020s that has to include an analysis and an argument about how we get a fair deal for towns, but also a one something that reaches out more broadly in terms of our values that recognises that we as a party have always stood up for, for equality, for opportunity, but also for social solidarity, and that those come together as a platform for fighting injustice in the future as well. I think we have have the ability to do that, to reach out, but we have to recognise the challenges we face on both of those dimensions and not be a narrow party anymore, not be a narrow factional hard left party, be a broad church that reaches out, not one that ends up looking inwards. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for that. Broad church sounds like the kind of overall... Uh, how broad do you want your church? Right. Um, well, there's a lot we can't predict about the 2020s, uh, but I think one, one fact that, that, is, that is, should form the centre of, of any projection about what Labour does is the thing I've been banging on about for the last five years, which is that the, the neoliberal model of economics is broken. It's only producing stagnation. It's producing uh, severe concern among everyone who has sight into it, central banks, treasuries. Um, it, 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 not only does it produce stagnation, but the counter-stagnation tools that central banks and treasuries have, fiscal policy and monetary policy, produce even more stagnation. And it's also producing, as we pump money in to the already asset-rich classes of the West, they get richer. So it produces not just stagnation, but greater inequality. And now, on top of that, and equally predictable, we have, the, the penny has finally dropped that this strategic problem for an economic model has begun to interact with another external crisis, which is the climate crisis. If you read Larry Fink's, uh, the BlackRock CEO, Larry Fink's letter to investors two weeks ago, basically says, we can't predict what these risks are. Our risks are now incalculable, from mortgages to city municipal bonds to insurance market. It's all incalculable. We're going to move capital on a vast scale into places that are not exposed to the risks of climate chaos. So that's the 2020s for me. But what has it already produced? But it's not just in Britain. All over the world, in response, it's produced a fracturing of elite politics between globalists who want to defend uh, the multilateral system uh, we have and the rules-based democracies that we have and anti-globalists of the right who have, in one country after another, and the latest one is this, constructed a new political alliance. So I'm looking at, first of all, what's happening on the other side. This new political alliance is, if you look at that, uh, the devastating re defeat report produced by, uh, by two, two academics yesterday, it's very clear that the two places where the Conservative vote is strong are leafy middle-class shires, where people are quite racist, and working-class, very poor towns, 
where unfortunately a lot of people are also quite racist. That is the new, that is the new political alliance that the right has, has created. And when I use the words that Hannah Arendt used in the 1930s to describe it, I'm not intending to, to in any way insult anybody. It's just a very useful political tool to describe it. Anna, Hannah Arendt described pre-Nazism and Nazism as the temporary alliance of the elite and the mob. Now, I'm afraid I have first, and every one of us has first-hand experience of what that now means. Not just on the election, but being surrounded by people in Whitehall chanting Boris's name. People from the EDL. You know, people who came up to me with their cameras and said, Paul, we've researched you. That's what we're now up against. Now, Labour has to have an answer to both these problems. Well, not just both the problems. The problem of the economic <laughs> dysfunction of a system and the problem of having a new political alliance that I am afraid can win any election it wants to, certainly in England and Wales, uh, unless the left does something different. Because that's the lesson of 2019 for me. Now, the good thing is, I think buried in the complexities of the 2017 and 2019 manifestos, there is an answer. And it, it, it should have been easy to distill it down into three broad arguments. We have an answer on climate change, which is to decarbonise the economy by the state-directed investment, which now, of course, two weeks too late, has the back, you know, basically the backing of some of the biggest investment managers in the world. That this is now the new, the new orthodoxy, that states need to direct investment into decarbonising the economy. That's point one. In the process, what we add to this is a, a redistributive programme. And I think redistribution should have been and has to be at the centre of what Labour does going forward. I want, I'm, as you know, I'm backing Keir Starmer and I'll, I'm saying to Starmer and his team, you know, you need to say, whether it's on nationalisation, whether it's on, uh, you know, all the things that people in Labour want to do, the biggest question is, does this decarbonise the economy and does it redistribute wealth? And if it doesn't, then let's put it to the back of the queue. Um, the third thing is related to the redistribution, an investment-led strategy for, the, for, for getting what economic growth we can out of a, a, a growth-averse global system. I think that should be Labourism. State-directed investment, so that means the private sector be reviving on the basis of high value, the, the usual Brownite thing, high value, high skilled jobs can still be achieved in Britain, but there's less of them uh, and we have challenges in getting there. Now, what's the problem in getting that across? And this is my central point. I think, I think your research supports this, but you may not yourself draw this conclusion. We are, now, we are in a culture war. The culture war arrived in Britain before... It, it arrived in Scotland in 2014. The, the, what is driving politics now is, is less economics and party loyalty and more values, narratives and identities. And... This, again, has been something that I, within the kind of general Corbynite left of, of Labour, was insisted on. And to my frustration, I found that most, not just the leaders of, of, of the Corbynite left, but many of the members just do not accept this. They do not, they are not interested in fighting the culture war. For quite obvious reasons, because, of, if you, because it's, a, it's a break with our entire existence. But Leon Trotsky once said to, to a pacifist, you know, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And I think what happened in the election is that you may not be interested in fighting the culture war, but it just defeated you. And, and we need to come up with answers to that. And, and in the short time available, I want to just say what mine are. Um, we, I, I think absolutely, Labour has always been a kind of tribal alliance. Um, so what's the, what's the, what is the concomitant of you, this conclusion? Is that Economics didn't work. The whole idea that Camden's the same as Wigan, which, by the way, is wrong, that Camden and Wigan are, are weirdly, equally uh, poverty-stricken. They're about the 69th and the 74th on the list of poverty-stricken boroughs in Britain. But, for example, the, the Christmas tree of, of demographics is Camden's hugely young, Wigan is hugely old. The health statistics for Camden are better than the British average on everything, perinatal mortality, obesity, uh, deaths from cancer, deaths under 75, uh, suicides, or better. Wigan 
is much, much worse. It's a different reality. And to go on blithely saying, whether you live in Camden or Wigan, Middlesbrough or wherever, it's wrong. And so we have to accept that the new tribal alliance we have to construct has to literally be an act of reaching out from, by people in one part of that reality to another. Now, I think that the, that I'll finish with, a, with, with an example. See, see in Lee where I come from, which we, you know, Lee went liberal in 1885, Labour at the first opportunity, 1921, and back to the Conservatives, ending a century and a half nearly, a century and a bit of progressive politics. In, in, and it did, it, it's ended. Uh, I think we can get it back, but it ended decisively. Why? Well, for all the reasons I described, but the, the uh, racism became a cultural narrative that was acceptable in public spaces. You, if I couldn't say to you, no, if I worked at the Resolution Foundation, hey, Torsten, I think we should round up all the Romanians and their kids, lock them in a van and drive them to Dover. That's true. You, I hope you would sack me. But this, was, this is among people, I'm sorry, who do no longer work do, and certainly no longer work in, a, in a, a kind of regulated society or at workplace. This is what is said as normal in that society. Now, set against that, in the factory that used to be at the end of my street, Lee Spinners, it's now a workspace for community arts projects, maker labs, uh, small businesses, coffee shops. And it's a huge factory, but like symbolically, it's occupied by people who are tangibly modern and progressive. And they ran out of their houses to grab leaflets off us, sometimes in their bare feet. In one case, followed, a woman followed me in her slippers down the road, telling me enthusiastically about what a brilliant future Lee had if they would only expand this kind of economy. Now, it's quite obvious that that woman's problem is she can't persuade her father or grandfather not to go with this hugely horrible populist narrative that's taken off in that town. What was the result for us was that the candidate, the excellent candidate, Joe Platt, couldn't appear in public. She was terrified to appear in public. Uh, she kept herself out of the limelight and, we, and the party held a grand total of one public events during the entire election for one and a half hours, at which we spent the entire one and a half hours being harangued by people whose views are frankly the same as the UKIP and the BNP and the EDL. That's where we are now in those communities. Now, to go forward, we've got to construct a party that can be a social movement. That social movement has to be able to root itself in the people who agree with us. Okay? It can't start with the people who disagree with us, but once rooted as a social movement through community activism, organising, not the kind that we've been doing, but the real Alinskyite communitarian organising, we can do that, we can construct a narrative which is you know, better jobs and save the planet, and, and nothing else, by the way. No anti-imperialism, no worries about you know, what's going on in Venezuela, you know, we've got to be rigorous in constructing a narrative, but the one, the political task is for us to mobilise people like that young woman, you know, in the community arts centre, to be able to do the reaching out. And it's not, I, I, can't, I can't tell you it's going to be easy. Um, I think it's going to be easy to sit in the Labour Party and, and use it as a kind of protection capsule against a decade of horribleness. I know that because that's what, happened to us in the 80s and 90s that's what we did but I think if we can break out of that and, and, and realize that we're in a crisis period um, and that the opportunities for social democracy are there uh, the only answer we know from the 30s to an alliance of the elite and mob you know whether you like that phrase or not it's a, it's a resonant phrase the only answer is an alliance of the center and the left and, my, and what I'm saying to my colleagues in the left you've got to accept that the world has changed, politics has changed, and therefore your tactics and your strategy has to change. Right, thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. Right, let's, um, we're going to come for questions in a second, but let's, let's just go one question for each of you, drawing out kind of the arguments you've made and then where they go. It's important you went first, so you're going to go first. Okay, so like one reading of your slides <laughs> and the argument is... Um, there's a longer term realignment going on in British politics, which you're showing most clearly through the change in which seats Labour uh, represents. This is, you know, it may have gone further or more slowly in different elections, but the trend is uh, clear. Um, 
it turns out, this is not integral to it, but it turns out that this realignment isn't very good for actually forming governments. Like, it's just like electorally inefficient realignment that happens to be uh, going on. So that's, that's kind of not good news for a Labour Party. And then your really bad bit of news, which is you can't close, you can't kind of, you can't deal with that by uniting on economics broadly. You can't do what the Labour Party would want to do, which is to say we represent these different places, but, uh, but economic policy preferences uh, can unite across that otherwise rather large divide. Conclusion, it's all very difficult. <laughs> now, what, one, is that fair? And two, come on, what's your slightly more constructive answer? OK. Well, I mean, as an academic, that's my job to say things are all very oh, difficult, surely. Okay. <laughs> the the solutions are for other people, surely. <laughs> um, but I think one thing I wrote down, which I think answers your question a little bit, when, when Paul was talking, this idea that you can't unite on economics, and it's certainly very difficult to unite on economics, but that is what the Conservatives did. Hmm. So actually, the Conservatives managed to hold on, and we didn't get into hung Parliament territory, because they kept voters we thought might go to the Lib Dems on economic issues. So actually, although we ha it hasn't happened on the left, it appears to have been possible on the right. So I think the, the really critical thing is actually to stop talking about these two dimensions as if they are not interacting with each other, because actually they are, and they interact with each other in a really complex way. So I think that's the, the key message for me is to start... The, the way I develop this just to further... That, just to make that concrete for those who haven't had to read all your stuff. So <laughs> do we mean... If you go too lefty on the economics, it will be more alienating on the social, the liberal axis as well. Partly, but it's also partly that the image, it's, it's an image thing on some of these issues. So if you go to the very liberal end on the liberal scale, it makes people who <coughs> actually agree with you on economics think you're not talking to them. So actually you end up with this complex interaction of economic views and um, social values. But I think in order to, to um, capture that and begin to understand that, it's useful to think about value groupings rather than... So in the same way that sociologists develop models of social classes, which aren't firm boundaries but represent places within the class structure, I think you can do the same thing with the value structure and start to identify some groups of voters. It won't be, there won't be hard boundaries, but they do allow you to start to see certain groups of voters and see where the problems have occurred. And for Labour, if you look at that over time, the problem has occurred primarily amongst voters on... I'll use the term left authoritarian, which I know I'm going to get shouted at for at some point, but, but um, those voters feel unrepresented. And they are unrepresented, right? If you, if you want to nationalise the railways and bring back the death penalty, who do you vote for? Um, so they feel unrepresented, they feel disconnected from politics, and have voted for different parties at different times. Some of them voted Lib Dem in 2010. They voted all over the place. What's happened to those voters primarily since 2017 is that they're staying home. So a big story that we, we can't mm -hmm. see in the data that we have at the moment, we won't see this until the summer when we get the British election study data, is that people who are in that part of the value space were much more likely to stay home in 2017 than they have been in earlier elections. It's the first election since 92 where values predict turnout. Values don't usually predict turnout. Turnout's usually kind of economic resources and a bit of randomness. Um, but values predict turnout in 2017. So I think we have to start thinking, in the same way we, that we think about classes, we need to stop thinking about classes, because that's actually not helping us very much anymore, and start thinking about values groups instead. And which of those values groups should Labour be? Like, where, which, well, matters, which matters most? So I, th well, the biggest... We're not going to get the death penalty one. Well, that, but that's the biggest one in the electorate, so that's the problem. <laughs> so what's the answer? Death penalty? No. Oh, right. no. Thanks. It's reassuring. <laughs> well, maybe, but no. The, the, the answer to, is appealing to them on that other set of values, so knowing that they have a complex mm. set of values. But that if you go into those groups talking to them about all the things that Paul's saying that you're going to drop, you know, your, your discussions about Venezuela and imperialism, if you go to those voters talking to them about them, they're not listening to you on economics. It doesn't matter what you say mm. to them on economics. I mean, to be fair, hardly anyone's listening on the Venezuela stuff anyway. Well, I was, I, another thing I wrote down, the first party leaflet I got in my home constituency... 66 policies on the back of it, including recognising Palestine um, and all sorts of other things that, that were on the back of that 
on the back of that thing. Now, they are not helping you talk to those voters. You know, they're not helping you get messages. It, it read like somebody had emptied a suggestion box onto a, onto a leaflet. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's about, it's not always about policy. Sometimes it's, it's about communication. Definitely not always about policy. Um, one final point about the populism stuff that I'd like to make yeah. is that there's lots of academic research that talks about how populists communicate. So not what they're communicating, but how they communicate. And I think there are lessons to be learned to take from that style of communication back to Lee to wait so that you can talk to voters in a, in a, I don't want to say in a language they understand, but in a form that they understand. To the ones with shoes on as well, not just the ones that... The slippers. Yes, yeah, to the ones with shoes on. Okay, right, now, <laughs> event. So your big argument is broadly narrow parties don't win elections, particularly in a electoral system like ours on the left. So, and I think that's kind of reasonably uncontroversial as like a reading of history or of the values uh, space we've been talking about. Are we sure the Labour Party members want to be a broad party? <laughs> oh, that, I mean, that's the question for this leadership election and that um, uh, whether we end up uh, becoming more and more narrow or staying narrow or whether we are ready as a, a party membership to broaden out. And I madly hope that um, that we will broaden out. Um, I mean, I nominated Keir. I also think that uh, Lisa is also talking about um, reaching out. But I think it's really important that in our um, uh, this leadership election, that is what we do. I suppose just sort of some thoughts, just in terms of the things that that Paula and, and Paul have said. I mean, look. You know, the Labour Party has been strongly against the death penalty for a very, very long time, and we have still won elections. So that, I think, is becomes an unfair caricature almost of, of yeah, what yeah. Paul is saying in terms of the, the value, yeah. uh, you know, the value reach that we have to have. And that's why I kind of talk about this in terms of this is actually about progressive communitarian values, which have always been part of the Labour movement. This is not about compromising who we are in order to say, well, there's these values that are important. Actually, this has been a really important part of who we are. So if you talk, there's a, a really nice piece written by um, uh, some called Rachel Bergen about the Workington, why um, the Copeland um, uh, election should have been canary in the coal mine for then losing Workington after that. And what she describes, and this is, you know, this is where my mum grew up. And so it absolutely captures it. It's also very similar to, to Lee and to Pontefract and Castleford, the working class mining communities where the, the sense of the, uh, the solidarity that you build up as part of the uh, doing such a dangerous job over so many decades and the way in which communities supported each other, the way in which communities also would take in your neighbour's child if your neighbour, if there was an appalling mining accident, which there were, with a sense of families supporting each other, that sense of community solidarity, those sort of solidarity values and respect and the belief that you support your neighbour because of who your neighbour is, not because of a sense of liberal values about everybody's the same in our common humanity, but a sense that relationships matter, that your neighbours matter because they are your neighbours and you owe them obligations because they are your neighbours, that you owe your family obligations because they are your family, that those relationships matter, and that you have obligations to your country because it is your country, that patriotism is important and has value. Those sorts of communitarian values, I think, have always been part of the Labour tradition, and yet our party, I think, has looked in recent years as though those were strands and sets of values that we didn't care about and that we didn't stand up for and instead it was just all became increasingly about the liberal values. Now personally I've always thought both the liberal and communitarian values are both important. There are times in Labour's history in the past when I have objected to things that the Labour government that was doing that I thought was going too much in the communitarian direction and wasn't recognising some of the, the liberal issues. So I always thought it's really important to include both. But this sort of feeds into as well um, Paul's point about, about the culture war. And so I think the, um, I don't accept that this is an inevitable culture war. I think the idea of it being a culture war, the, that's what the far right want it to be, is they want it to be a culture war. We uh, on the left and the progressives should be talking about what are our shared values and what are the things that we have in common. It's the Joe Cox phrase about we have more in common than that which divides us and not allow ourselves to get pushed into a kind of uh, culture war. 
And I would say, you know, as part of that, that the Labour Party has always stood up against racism. We have our challenges at the moment about dealing with anti-Semitism as part of that. But we have also, it's always been part of um, the things that we have we have done and was, must continue to be so. But equally, I think it is, I think it is wrong to end up describing communities or voters who left us as being racist because I know there are plenty of people in Pontefract and Castleford who did not vote Labour this time, who have voted Labour many times before but did not vote Labour this time, maybe because they just didn't believe our sums added up and they just didn't think we were credible. Maybe because actually they voted to leave and they did just want to get Brexit done and they thought we're just going round and round in circles and they just were fed up of the whole thing. Maybe because actually they just thought that Jeremy was not patriotic enough because they didn't see him sing the national anthem and that was something that was really important to them. So there were a whole ro range of reasons and if we allow it to or characterise it as a culture war in Castleford, that is just, I think, misunderstanding what has happened in this election and the, the strong Labour communities that want to be Labour, that want to be able to support a credible Labour government, but just did not feel they could do so this time. OK. And then, Paul, your question, which is, so you obviously like there is a culture war, and it's not so keen, but, the, but on the, if there is a culture war, you're, you're like what modern Labourism is, is basically an economic agenda, is decarbonise via state-led investment, redistribute wealth and invest to get more private sector growth. Th those are economic arguments to which you see. Are you sure you're not saying you want to bring, I don't know what the fighting version is, but it's like bringing a club to a knife fight or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So go sure. on. So, does your prescription match up with your description of the problem? Well, because for, for that exact reason, uh, for, for the exact reason that, that Yvette just said, you, you, you don't want to be fighting a conflict on cultural values. Okay. Yeah. However, what what there is there is the the question of what is the Labour Party? What does it represent? Well, you know, seventy percent of its membership is in London, Bristol, and Manchester. Uh, half its membership are are C two, what C C one and above. More than half its membership. Um, and what we if you look at the, the what happened after the before and during the May. Uh, the, what happened to the polls during the, the European elections of 2019 was that Labour dropped from something like 33% to 22% simply because its NEC refused to back a second referendum. So the cultural, the fragility of that, what you might call, if there's a third of Britain that's progressive, that, that has progressive liberal cultural values, on your scale, liberal and socio-economically left values, um, get one thing can tip a third of them to go and vote for the Lib Dems. Uh, and really, they don't care whether or not Labour gets in or not. They, they, um, what's the problem is that they are, they are, they are then, polit and this is a long term. It's you know, the, from the Alpha in Index onwards that it's a long term detachment of everybody, as you say, from party loyalty. So, we, so the party itself has to be an alliance. And what I'm arguing is, is that it would have to be an alliance to start with around certainly. A pro so I see the climate thing as 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 cultural as well as economic because when when you're in where, where was it? I think Burnley not in this election but but when I was when I was a reporter it when I was a reporter on UKIP actually it was in Burnley Grimsby and, and places like it where one of the biggest source drivers of, of membership of UKIP in that mid 2010s was opposition to what they call windmills, yeah. i.e. onshore wind farms. Uh, and, and, and it's linked to climate denial. Now, so I think that, that cl putting climate at the centre of Labour's uh, pro project is in its way a signifier and should bring some of those, should solidify that vote of the left anti-authoritarians. And, and for me, it's then a, a, a question of doing something overt, of having an argument with Labour's membership that says this, look, 70% of you are city-dwelling, degree-owning, you know, uh, sort of progressive people in big cities, right? No, no, you, you've just learned that that doesn't win an election. And there's 80 to 120 town seats in the north of England, in, in North Wales, in the Midlands. Uh, I mean, even Birmingham Northfield, where I campaign, which you, in, in, in no textbook on earth should have gone conservative. Um, these places are going to need something more than what you currently believe. So there has to be an overt act of reaching across that divide. Um, but that, what I mean by 
I don't want to fight the culture war culturally. No, I absolutely want to do it with with a with a with a with an economic offer that 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 embeds the values of the membership into a very crystallised thing, and does what you know. I've been saying this inside the inside the movement since 2015. What I learned from whatever you think about Tsipras, he constructed in Greece a, an election-winning coalition of the centre and the left. The party is, you know, is, has a green and a purple bit in its banner because it incorporated the, all the feminist movements and all the green movements inside Syriza, and then they absorbed most of social democracy. So the idea of creating a party as an alliance has to be an overt thing. Okay. The, um, um, uh, just on uh, a slight way, there's an issue which we, we don't, there's a danger we all agree too much. So here's like a way of shaking <laughs> it up a little bit, okay? Another, the reading of this, which is broadly a look backwards, look how Labour's coalition has fractured over the past, and what is the political strategy that either slows or reverses the fracturing of that mm. coalition is broadly the tone of this conversation. Let's just try a different version of the conversation, which is a different lesson from the 2019 election is. This 40-year um, coalition uh, co chain realignment of politics has been going on that Brexit has, as Yvette says, turbocharged, is going on. The party that won in 2019 is the side of, is the party that embraced its new coalition at some cost, although while keeping as much as it could, but basically embraced the new part of its coalition. And that the real lesson for Labour is good luck trying to rebuild your old coalition. Look at all of Paul's charts showing you the trend of history. Embrace your new coalition. If that is your new coalition, you can't have Labour Liberals existing in their current form. Uh, you need to be winning seats. You're becoming, you're becoming a more southern party and you're becoming a more cities party, but it can't be just the core cities. Um, and so actually, embrace your liberalism. Uh, stop pretending to yourself. You can reverse the realignment uh, and make sure you do what's necessary to avoid the split of the vote and to avoid um, all the kind of flagrant like not being a credible party problem but like uh but that's what you've got to do yeah. competent be liberal embrace it stop looking like a like you're split and accept the world as it is not as you would like it to be two points first i wanted to pick up something that paul said about yeah. about that alliance that took in the green movement and the feminist movement yeah. i would say actually labor's already done that part mm. if you look at what happened in 20 it, what happened in 2017 was largely doing that it was winning over voters what was left of the liberal democrat vote and a lot of green votes but, this, but what it hasn't done is keep that centre on board. And that's the problem, losing the centre. Um, and I've forgotten what my second point was. I'll have to it come was back. excellent. OK, we'll come back to it in a second. Oh, no, I've remembered. Sorry. Okay, I, I remembered. It's, it's the worry that I have. <coughs> people, as I said, people get very cross with me when I, when I worry about left authoritarians. But the worry that I have is that if you to go down that route and you stop talking to those groups, then the EDL and all those other groups are going to talk to them and you leave a big vacuum and we've seen what's happened in other parts of Europe when that's happened. Are you sure the Tories aren't going to talk to them? I don't think they're going to talk to them. I think ultimately they will disappoint them. Yeah. We'll find out next week. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, but... I think it might take a bit longer than that for the what? shine to rub off. Oh, right, OK, fine. <laughs> yeah, but... um, I think um, no, because I think, first of all, it goes against our values. And it would mean that we, the Labour Party, would be representing those who actually do best out of the current globalisation, trade and technology, and not those who get hit hardest. We would be uh, failing to represent the places where there can be some of the greatest deprivation or inequality, and that is not who we are. I think, secondly, I still believe, as I said before, that these communitarian values are an important part of Labour's spread of values. I don't believe just in being a, um, a kind of left liberal party. I think we should be a party that whose values that values social solidarity as well as our liberal um, values. And I also think that thirdly, I don't think actually trying to do that will work because what underpins our failure to hold together cities and towns actually is a failure to properly have an argument about how you redistribute economic power and how you tackle economic injustice and inequality in the new economy with trade and technology moving in a different way. We used to think that the answer to the redistribution was about ownership. Actually, ownership might have some impact in some areas, but it doesn't solve all of those inequality problems. We 
used to think that the answer was about redistributing education. Well, that's great. A lot of people get a great education from towns and then move away. Mm -hmm. Education is not the only way in which you tackle those uh, injustices and now power is very much about networks it's about concentrations the new monopolies are in the big kind of social media and internet companies we're not challenging those the new power becomes if you are live in a city where you have huge networks at your disposal you have much greater power and opportunity than if you live in a small town or if you're isolated in other ways or you don't have those connections so I actually think that simply taking a kind of superficial thing which says okay this is where our coalition is at the moment our new coalition so go with it actually doesn't work in the long term because what it reflects is that we the Labour Party who have always prided ourselves on having an analysis of economic power and redistribution we don't actually have one that works at the moment for the 21st century and for the 2020s. But that is, a, that is an argument rooted in a kind of moral judgment or about what the Labour Party should be for and it's an argument rooted in what are the important questions facing the country Yes. It's not, it's not at least front and centre an argument rooted in sophology of can you actually, can that, have, can that win? No, but in the end, I think the two things in the end take you to the same place. Because I don't think, I mean, I think like, I start from being a member of the Labour Party for moral reasons. Sure. So I think that is important. But I want us to win. And I think, to be honest, we're going to be waiting a very long time. And we're going to end up actually losing our sense of soul if we just go down that kind of let's just focus on our new coalition and wait for it to grow enough to be able to win us votes we'll corrode our soul in the meantime and forget who we are okay no soul corroding is a good thing in life okay paul you just quickly briefly on yeah. your answer to this, then we'll get some questions i mean another way of, of posing this and i'm sorry to introduce this this theme it, it is philosophically oh, because 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 Liberalism is liberalism, and, and, and if you look at Storm, you know, all the moral socialism, you know, the social justice, economic justice, it's, it's, although some of his followers don't quite realise this, it's straightforward Rawlsian, you know, deontological, uh, you know, Kantian, right, you know, right. but, okay. No more philosophers. <laughs> no, well, it is, that's what it is. However, in a working class town like Lee, there almost, there, there almost is no... Rawlsians. Rawlsian philosophy. There is almost no. <laughs> there is actually almost no centre. There are almost there are no university lecturers. There are no. There is no high. There is no. There is no post sixteen education in Lee. Yeah. You know? No. The thing is, in that community, it's a discussion about exactly you know, another way of posing it. Community. It's a. It's an. It's a discussion about virtue. What is virtuous? No, with the left authoritarians, so the pro-death penalty, anti-immigration people, who are nevertheless want our programme, there is a discussion to be had with them about what is the good society and what does a person who lives in that society look like. That is how we want to equip our members and activists and our narrative givers to go into those places to have that discussion. And I think that it's actually what's the biggest problem is that they don't want to do it. That is what we're finding out right now, is that large part numbers of people in the Labour Party are meeting right now to decide that they don't want to change anything whatsoever about what they did. Um, so I, I think that, that there's a discussion that, that could be had between me and you, Yvette, about how we action what you want to do and how we keep on board the people whose values are incredibly liberal and anti-authoritarian. But in the end, the, the, getting them to do it is going to be the biggest challenge. Okay, great. Right. Let's get some uh, questions from whether you're left authoritarian or other. That's Probably great. Not so many of those. Not, I, this isn't a core left authoritarian demographic. Right, we'll take these two next to each other for ease, and then we'll take the gentleman in the middle there. Give us your name, sir. Uh, Guy from KPMG. So there's 91 <coughs> parliamentary constituencies in the UK uh, where the Liberal Democrats came second in. 80 of those are the Conservatives won. That's their majority. Um, the Labour Party, to me, has always seemed to be the only... They've seemed to be the only party in their eyes that can embody progressive values, that can deliver mm -hmm. change. Um, where you're starting from, from the 1930s, as you said, the worst election results, do you think that you need to reach out to the Liberal Democrats and other progressive parties? And do you think you have to do that to stop a Conservative majority at the next election? Great question. Go ahead, sir. Hi, sorry, I'm, I work for Tech UK at the moment, which is a trade body for tech companies. What's your name, my, sorry, my name's Neil. But in a previous sort of life, I used to work for Labour MPs in the House of Commons, some who are still members of Parliament after the 2019 election and some who aren't. Um, one of the things I've noticed in the kind of eight years I've worked with and for the Labour Party is that in the last three years, it seems like the party has sort of systematically detooled its ability to communicate with the voters that we lost, particularly in the kind of northern heartlands and areas that were our uh, bridges. 
my kind of question is what practical steps does the party need to take to kind of reskill and retool not just our membership and our MPs, but the kind of wider commentary that sits around the Labour Party that effectively represents it when people first interact with the party on the news, on Twitter, to kind of continue to deliver the messages that we want in order to win in 2024 and then in 2029. Okay. Uh, my name's David Coates. Um, I agreed with Paul um, in much of what he said about the need to put the environment at the centre of what Labour has to uh, um, say to the electorate. But it seems to me that you can't really talk about saving the planet credibly unless you have a policy for international collaboration. Uh, and it seems to me that part of the task Labour faces is articulating a progressive internationalism mm -hmm. that isn't obsessed with Venezuela mm -hmm. and Cuba. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems to me that we can't then avoid <laughs> talking about the European Union and how Labour relates to the European Union and the role that Europe can play in tackling the global climate crisis. And if we're concerned about people on the authoritarian liberal spectrum and patriotism as an alternative to nationalism, we can't avoid talking about defence and security policy. Uh -huh. And we need to talk about NATO and perhaps post-NATO, and what happens if Trump wins, and how we secure the national interest in a Europe that will be potentially destabilised by the retreat of the US and uh, Russian interventionism. So how do you, you respond just to, push to this? David, are you, is this, is this, is this, are you tiptoeing around the re-entry question, or are you on Brexit? Is that well, come on. I mean, Torsten, you, you, you know me well can, enough to know what I would think about that, but okay. I'm asking Yvette and okay. Paul and so let's get the work what they would do about okay. it, how, how do you... they would address those issues. Oh, right, okay, fine, I'm not fine. here to answer questions, just ask them. Oh, I see. Oh, I, see. <laughs> I, 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 didn't realize, as, I thought we were all taking responsibility, David. <laughs> right, come on then. Okay. Right, Guy asked uh, um, uh, the Lib Dem vote question, which is a more kind of direct <laughs> version of what I was trying to nudge you all on, which is one of the slightly odd things about this election is that the Lib Dems had a turkey in lots of ways, but actually got quite a lot of votes mm. compared to 2017. Uh, so maybe we should just try and, the Labour Party, sorry, should try and hoover up a load of those votes, uh, and that's the only route to win, or at least co-op the party, even if you can't hoover them directly. Yvette, Lib Dem hoovering. Um, yeah, I think, look, when you're building a coalition, you want to squeeze votes from all directions. I think that um, there's uh, a group of um, people who voted Lib Dem this time, who voted Labour last time, who actually some of that was about credibility. So actually it was about the economic strand. It wasn't actually about the sort of values um, uh, strand, social values strand. Actually it was about uh, on the economic uh, thing of just figuring that um, we were just not credible enough. But I think um, anybody who just thinks the you can build a coalition just from saying, well, it's, uh, you know, Lib Dem voters, Green voters and Labour voters, again, just it, our working class towns, the communities that built the Labour Party in the first place, that is not where those votes are going. And therefore, I just think we should be representing those communities because we, you know, this is about injustice and inequality and what kind of party we are right across the country. So, yes, by all means, I would squeeze Lib Dem votes, but I just don't think if the people think that's the alternative to winning votes back from the Conservative Party and the Brexit Party, that to me doesn't stack up to make us who we are. Okay. I would like to just brief on David's. Oh, yeah, so should, I could, oh, should, we, should we just get yeah. back in or not? Um, so, um, no, I think that um, uh, this is, I think that Keir has been right to say that um, uh, the Leave Remain debate is done and the um, uh, Britain is leaving on Friday, that the debate should be about what our relationships are with the future, not about talking about, you know, second referendums anymore, not about talking about any of those things, which actually, in the end, I think, ended up proving counterproductive. I think history will judge them as being counterproductive in terms of us getting a sustainable, long-term relationship, either with our European partners or with everybody else. But I think, I, my sense was the main heart of your question, David, was about what kinds of 
of international relationships we should have in the future, how we stop ourselves becoming a country that looks inwards and pulls away from those crucial economic, those crucial, not just economic, but security relationships in future, and how instead we rebuild those because international cooperation is crucial on climate change, on security, on so many of those things. And I think this is, uh, it makes the NATO becomes more important than ever, but I agree with you, this is hard depending on what on earth it is the um, Americans under Trump are up to. But I think the um, how we make sure we have a close relationship with Europe, both on the security and economic dimension, is going to be the huge question of the next 12 months and probably the next five years as well. And I suspect this will be a rocky process in which the government will sort of veer in one direction or another. And Labour is going to have to be a strong voice for proper long-term future economic cooperation and security cooperation, but to do that in a way which is forward-looking and isn't doesn't look like this is just about rerunning the debates of the last three years. Paul, on Neil's question in particular, on how do you like on the I think your detooling was the, uh, yeah, the question. No, the, I think it's a whole other question, and the, the short version is: you, before you can retool, you've got to stop trying to run the leadership of the Labour Party as a faction fighting everybody else. You've got to, this is why I'm supporting Starmer, you've got to build something that, that negotiates and, can, and, and with everybody else. But I just want to come back to the question of, 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 of Europe. The, I've spent two years or more trying to drag a bunch of people who don't want to hear this, i.e. the Labour left, onto the territory of saying crime, security and defence are working class issues. They are as important on the doorsteps of where you are and Lee and the rest as the economics are. They just don't buy it, but, there are, but they kind of get it. They kind of get that we have to do that. The one thing that I think we win, we're, it will, that is going to be the, the, the deal breaker in the attempt to get the essentially liberal membership of Labour to reach out to those communities is not any of those issues, it's migration. Because when we leave Europe, freedom of movement will end. And many parts of the left have, have decided that freedom of movement is a socialist principle, and it's like a, a fundamental existential principle for them. Now, I think we're, by the next election, there'll be an Australian-type point system, and our manifesto should be what should be the criteria for the points. Um, but I can tell you that if it's hard to get the Labour left to accept 2% 2, 2 defence spending on NATO, which I support, or maintain the deterrent, it is going to be much harder, not just with the left, but with that liberal, green, yeah, the whole bunch of people who gravitated on your graph towards us between 2010 and 2017, for them that's an existential thing. So I, I think it's going to be really hard to, to make that leap. Okay, let's get just two more questions then I want to release everyone to their dates. There's a lady here. And there's a gentleman here at the front. Hi there. Um, my name's Sally and I work for a charity called the National Deaf Children's Society. Um, so we represent deaf children, their families, you know, some of the most sort of vulnerable children in society. And my question's around public services because I think, you know, la the Labour Party has, you know, forever been a party about public services, the NHS schools. And I think the Conservatives seem to have won quite a lot of votes based on the end of austerity, you know, funding public services again. And my question really is just, do you think it is the end of austerity? Do you think people, really vulnerable people, will be let down? Um, and how can the Labour Party win back that sort of vote? And how can they trump what the Conservatives are saying about public services and funding? OK. Uh, Laurie, Laurie Edmonds from various places, including uh, until recently the chair of the pension scheme of a large newspaper group. Um, but my question is about a dimension which seems to be missing from your analysis, which is the change in employment patterns. The, the, the majority of people in the UK are now employed by SMEs rather than by big businesses. The number of people who are self-employed has risen hugely over the period in your, in, your, in your analysis. The people that I was speaking to before the election were more worried about the kind of change that could impact on where their next pay packet was going to come from than they were about the grander issues that by and large have been discussed today. Sh should employment patterns be one of the factors that are being taken into account as you look forward uh, to the uh, okay. way, way things work? Okay, that's great, because there's two totally different kind of places to come in it. So what the Tories will do on public services spending and austerity is obviously for next week's discussion, but what, what's going, what Labour's lead on public services has diminished significantly over the last year, and what, what's going on? 
I think what um, Boris Johnson managed to um, achieve was to make himself the embodiment of change and to discard his association with the last 10 years of the Tory government that he was part of. <coughs> and that, in some sense, was our failure by our failure to pin that on him. Um, uh, because the I, you know, he has been voting for cuts in public services, and um, the the plans that they have set out may relatively be a change in terms of NHS funding, for example. But uh, compared to the last few years, however, compared to the scale of need and compared to the scale of need of investment in our NHS, in our children's services, uh, in our local government services, and so on, it's it's tiny in proportion to the scale of need and the scale of demand there is. So I think a lot of people are going to end up being disappointed. I think they will have a lot of jazzy, snazzy announcements of you know headline sums that they're going to spend on all kinds of things. But by time those announcements actually start to play through, and you see, well. Not, not much is going to change very much um, and they're going to be sort of running to stand still. I think in the end Labour's arguments about public services are as important as ever they were. Our problem was in the election on it was first of all the, um, the, the Boris Johnson branding which he won't be able to sustain but was a big issue for this election and secondly the sense of our credibility that people just didn't believe in many areas that we were going to be able to deliver. The, the changes that we promised for public services, but I think actually there was strong support for those public services and for, for the offer on public services. Um, it's just sort of building the credibility side of it as well. Um, and then the other point about in terms of the employment um, patterns, I think this is really important as part of it. And it is part of what I suppose I was saying about how, you know, you have, we labor has to be about how you redistribute economic power in the new economy of the future. And so for me, employment patterns and the changing employment, the changing sense of insecurity, how you deal with automation, all of those things are a fundamental part of that. I tend to bang on about the geographic bit of the picture, partly because as an MP for four towns, and I think we haven't had a fair deal for quite a long time, not just because of private sector economic changes, but because of actually the Tory austerity decisions, which have hit our towns much harder and we have lost public services from our towns. And that's the other kind of thing that links these two questions, actually, is because for, for us in our towns, we've seen public services just disappear from towns. So talking about reinvesting in services that have just gone because mm. they've been centralised in the cities, therefore has less of a sense of people thinking, is it going to benefit their lives if the service has disappeared altogether? And so we, I think, need both the investment in the public services and against austerity, but also to, to be able to explain the new economy, both in terms of employment patterns, the kinds of jobs that there will be in future, and how you give people economic power, how you challenge inequality in those, that new employment pattern, as well as the geographic one that I always bang on about. And Paula, do you have the last word, and we'll, and we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, actually, I, I wanted to bring together something from the first three questions, which kind of feeds it all together, if, if that's okay. So I thought what, what really united the first three questions was actually that all of the things that are being said, could we do this, could we do that, what's happened, are critically dis dependent on the membership of the party. And if you can't take the membership of the party with you to do any of those things, there's going to be real problems. And one thing I want to say about that membership, but also that... that not wider, co narrower coalition of well-educated voters. The data I showed you based on having a six plus to vote for a party. The well-educated liberal left usually have at least two, more often than not have three, because they will say six plus for Labour, for the Greens and for the Lib Dems. And if they're in Scotland, for the SNP as well. The left authoritarians typically have zero. Um, and so that, that well-educated... Um, group is fragile it's very very fragile um, and that's that's part of the problem there is that single issues as, as you alluded to can can tip them off to to somebody else at any point on the second two questions i think one of the things that that might unite those is um issues around local government and for lots of people they don't know who provides what service so if they've got local labor council and conservative government making cuts to those council they don't know who's to blame and that's when you end up with everybody being seen as the same um, and I think that's the problem in fighting back at that level. Great okay can we um, thank the panel for all their views today?
I think we can safely conclude it's a big problem. It's a big problem. <laughs> it's really difficult to solve. Bro a broader church wouldn't hurt in uh, uh, doing that. If that was interesting for you, all of you can come along next week and we're going to be discussing what should a new Conservative government do and is it really a new Conservative party or is it the same one representing a few different seats? Paula's given you her answer. You can hear some Tory answers next week. Have a good day, everyone.